Hi, it's Jerry Roberts back with yet another episode in Journal of the Plague Year. And today our special guest is Delaney Smith, staff reporter for the Santa Barbara Independent, transmitting it looks like from your kitchen. Is that right? Yes. That yes, my own? whole kitchen consists of this area, but yes. <laughs> your undisclosed location. <laughs> are, you, are you pretty much uh, in lockdown? Are you getting out and about? Oh, I, I get out and about. Um, definitely, definitely my reporting has changed drastically and, and the majority of interviews I do are over the phone. Um, but I'm, I'm still out and about when I have to. Um, like I covered the, the protests last weekend on Friday. Um, those were very intense. The, yeah, the, uh, the open up our business. Yeah. yeah, what was that? Was that like a sort of a faux Trump thing that was going on? Did you recognize any of those people? Were they from here? Um, oh yeah, I recognized a lot of them from here. Um, I mean, we have even um, um, Charles Cole, who's running for assembly. Um, he was there with um, his father and, and his uh, campaign manager, Mark McIntyre, um, who, who many are familiar with in this community. Uh, a Carolina Bate, who um, I think many people are familiar with from she, well, Council. she is the, she's the most she's the face of the uh, Trump operation oh she had yeah. Trump from head to toe yeah um there were there was a few um Trump signs all around I can't make a blanket statement that everyone there was a, uh, a how Trump many people Trump. turned out for it there was a, at least 100 cars and then there was also you know maybe 30 protesters on foot too um yeah so definitely hundreds of people it's kind of hard to tell with the cars were they socially distancing the ones that were on foot? Some of them were, some of them weren't. Um, it was really strange. Everyone agreed on the fact that they want businesses to open up now, um, but some people there still agree with the fact that the coronavirus is a real legitimate um, pandemic and that we should be taking precautions. And then others were, um, I mean, one gentleman, I don't know if I wanna call him the gentleman, but literally screamed, um, at me that I was a fear monger because I was wearing a mask. You're kidding. So, <laughs> no. Um, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of hostility there, um, but there were folks who also were, were just, you know, doing their thing um, and protesting too. So it, it was a very mixed crowd. I really can't say it was all. Um, Here's the thing I don't get about it is, uh, you know, okay, I get you're for liberty and you're for personal liberty and that's fine. And if you want to smoke a cigarette or drive without a seatbelt or any of those things, that's your choice and I'm cool with it. But the mask is not to protect you. It's to protect me or in this case you. And you know, this idea that liberty means I don't have to listen to anybody about anything. I can do whatever I want seems to me to lack a certain strain of personal responsibility, which used to be present in conservative uh, perspectives. I, I would concur with that statement. <laughs> How was our man Charles Cole uh, looking? Is he, is he feeling optimistic uh, about, about the campaign, whatever the campaign is? He's running against what, Steve Bennett, right? The Ventura yes. County Supervisor for uh, Assembly. <laughs> Yeah, he no, he seemed to be very upbeat, um, very optimistic. He does take the the um, the pandemic seriously. As far as he was he was wearing a mask himself. He said he plans on donating plasma. Already has a um, appointment set up. So um, he he was he's very um, very supportive of that. But he seemed to be completely um, completely optimistic that he's gonna gonna win in, in November and that this isn't really gonna be an issue. So. Yeah, you know, I was thinking, uh, I was trying to remember the last time that we actually saw each other, uh, and it was March 5th. We did a show the Thursday after the election, uh, after the primary election at yeah. the studio, and we talked a lot about Charles Cole and everything, and just the amazing transmogrification of the world since then. And it's kind of like we didn't really have a clue. I think we might have, you know, said, yeah, yeah, there's this coronavirus thing going around. But it just, it happened so suddenly and so absolutely that it's just kind of stunning. And it's easy to forget that, you know? You're just locked up all day. At least I am. It's like I have to go to this medical appointment on Monday and I'm terrified to like 
get in my car, which is now covered with, you know, dust and stuff. And so then, this is the first time since, since March getting in your car and leaving? Yeah, well, I, I had one previous doctor's appointment the first uh, week after that. Yeah, and, and this, yeah, so this is the first time in like two months, more wow. than two months that I've been out. But anyway, all right, so you got this story up now at the indie website. Uh, I guess it came out of the briefing last night that the county uh, is having a difficulty meeting the standards of the governor's reopen criteria because why? Because um, to put in, and I can almost verbatim quote um, Greg Hart, um, these are not the standards that the county were, was preparing for. Um, they're just they're just not. Um, Newsom um, earlier in the week, as everyone um, knows, um, announced that Friday um, some businesses, low risk businesses, would be able to partially open up, um, but the actual full guidance wouldn't be released till later in the week. Um, though what the way he alluded to it, it did sound um, like like Santa Barbara County was totally good to go um, on the Tuesday Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, um, Vaughn De Reynoso reported, she gave us like a little report card of how the county's doing in, in different areas um, and gave us like a green, a yellow, or a red. Yeah. Um, we had no public health, the public health director. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. Public health director, um, Dr. Von De Reynoso. Um, we didn't have anything in the red on our report card. It, it was all greens and some yellows um, that we needed to work on, but um, she was incredibly optimistic that, um, as, um, that we'd be able to open up more because um, Newsom said that um, counties who meet his criteria would be able to have more local control and local governments would be able to kind of decide um, how fast to go through phase two into phase three, which is more higher risk businesses. Um, businesses like, um, you know, um, getting a pedicure, for example, you know, that's a much more higher risk than, you know, getting a toy at the toy store. Um, so though the counties um, that were supposed to be able to have more control over that, um, it turns out that it's so much stricter than we ever thought. Um, between Tuesday, so between Tuesday and Friday, did he, change the criteria or we just didn't look at the fine print it, it's neither um he said that there he gave us some very surface level criteria and said that um more detailed guidance would come um but the way that he had talked about the more detailed guidance he he made it seem like it wasn't going to be nearly as um restrictive as it actually was when it came out so it was a shock to um most county officials not just in our county and and the 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 sticking point, as I understand from your story, was you're not allowed to have had a COVID-related death in the previous 14 days. Is that right? Yeah, that's one. That's the strictest. Um, and another one is that um, you can't have more than than four positive cases in a day. Um, which, four positive cases in a day. Right. And and if we take out. Um, the Lompoc federal prison numbers, we can actually get pretty close to the goals. And, and that's where the issue is. And that's what makes our county so unique is although um, our, our county government has no authority whatsoever over what's going on inside of the prison, um, we do have, um, we, we are required to track all of their cases and report all of their cases. So the cases are counted in our numbers, even though we have zero ability to do anything about them. Um, and and the, um, unfortunately, the prison administration is not being um, transparent with, with anyone. With oh, media. I mean, it seems like there's, I don't know if it's a cover up yet, but it, it's certainly, they're being extremely secretive. And then you, these numbers like, you know, from day to day, it's like, oh, we have a hundred. Oh no, now we have 700, you know, and it's just, I guess that's because they've expanded the testing which is a good thing, I suppose, but it's just, it doesn't smell right what's going on. It doesn't smell right. And, um, and I can say, and obviously Ty uh, Tyler Hayden from um, The Independent has, has really been doing a great job of, of covering um, the, the stories from inmates' families of what they've been hearing. But um, even I've been getting emails. I got an email the other day um, from a woman who's a family member of an inmate, and she claims that, you know, there's five deaths inside of the prison, even though there's still only two reported. Um, and there's, there's, that's not an isolated incident. That's a daily incident of um, email and email and email and phone calls of people calling in saying, like, 
I'm hearing this from my loved ones and I can't do anything about it. And, um, and it doesn't match up at all um, with what's being reported. Yeah, I know you're not covering this piece with, but do you happen to know if any of the prisoners who are sick are in um, uh, the hospital, either in Lompoc or Santa Maria, outside of the prison grounds? You know, I actually asked that yesterday to every uh, to <laughs> to um, Dr. Henning Anzorg. I asked Greg Hart. Um, I asked Stuart Comer. I asked everyone who was at the conference yesterday, and and none of them were able to answer that. Um, I also asked if since the prison hospital has been erected on prison grounds, have they transferred inmates from area hospitals into that hospital um, as maybe, because I've also been wondering why are the hospital, hospitalization seemed to be going down a little bit and I thought maybe it's because they were transferred. Um, none of them could answer that question either. Um, and they said they don't have access. They don't have the information or because they didn't want to tell you? No, they quite literally said um, the prison administration will not tell the public health department. Um, the, all they will say is how many total cases have been reported and how many have recovered. They won't say how many are in a hospital, ICU, if, where they're being transferred to, um, and they won't tell their family members that, um, and they won't tell media that. They won't tell anyone. So it doesn't, and it doesn't sound like Santa Barbara County's, in terms of the state saying yes or no, go ahead. It doesn't sound like we're going to get out from under having the Lompoc prison numbers counted with ours. Is that right? Well, well, Greg said. I mean, he's he's having um, like Monique Lamone and Hannah Beth Jackson um, kind of lobby Newsom, and 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 they are making an effort to have Santa Barbara County be the exception and, and allow us to um, remove the prison from our data numbers. Um, we'll see how successful they are with that, but they are they are pushing um, Governor Newsom to allow us that exception. Wow, wow. So was Greg kind of blindsided by this? Because he's been very supportive of the governor throughout, and you know, even when he's kind of been pushed, he's like, "No, the governor's do the we're following the governor's order." What was, yeah. What was his? What what did you, what did you get? How did you read his reaction? I read his reaction that he was extremely disappointed. I don't think he um, fully agrees with um, with it, um, but he did make it really clear that um, we're not, Santa Barbara County is not gonna be one of those counties um, that ignores or defies the governor's orders. He's still going to respect the, the governor and respect the law. Um, and plus, um, you know, the, Newsom made the, um, we can call it a reminder, um, you know, made the reminder yesterday to the counties that are um, defying his order that they are at risk of, of losing billions of dollars um, of, of um, funds and, and recovery funds for this. Yeah. And Santa Barbara would be too if we made that same move. Yeah, I, and I guess it's, mo I think there are three rural counties that have done that. And yeah. you know, I mean, I have to say, I sort of see their point. I mean, if you're not kind of seeing this, these numbers and stuff happening all the time, and they're telling you to wear a mask and you can't go to work and, and you don't know anybody who, who's involved in it. I, I don't know. It's, a, it's just hard for everybody. And then you had, uh, you had a cover story last week uh, about efforts to uh, communicate for the, for the county to communicate better uh, with Latino communities and how that's going on. What, uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, so obviously across the country, right? Well, globally even, um, people of color and that and of basically non-white people, and I wanna um, define that term because I did get a few questions about that after my piece was published. When I say people of color, I, I mean anyone who identifies as other than white, no matter how light-skinned they may be. Um, and so people of color have been getting COVID at much higher rates, at disproportionately higher rates. Um, and, and they've been dying from it at disproportionately higher rates than white people have. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, why is that? And, and the same is reflected in our county. For us, though, I only focus on Latinos mostly because um, that's our community. Um, we have like less than 3%, I think, um, black population and even smaller than that of an Asian population. Um, um, but the issue that I kind of found, and obviously I'd have to write a book if I really wanted to get into why this is, and at the root of most of it all, it's really poverty. But um, a lot of it is, is culture, actually. And so that's what my piece was looking at, is 
Um, in disaster times like this, when we're sending out all these messages and, and everyone's confused and they don't know what's up from down, it seems like the laws are changing from day to day. Um, the messages can't simply just be translated into Spanish and sent out. Um, you know, these people live a completely different life, especially up north where the vast majority of our cases are in Santa Maria. A lot of those people live in multi-generational homes. You know, they're farm workers, they use public transportation. Um, so when we send out a message that says, set up a home office for your child to learn from home and, um, <laughs> you know, stay six feet away from other people um, on the bus and, and why don't you, you know, take a Zoom session to the strawberry fields. It just doesn't work, you know? Like we need to, they're gonna ignore the messages and, and they're gonna keep working to survive um, because, you know, their values are, I'm gonna go take care of my family and um, these messages don't apply to me. So I'm gonna keep taking care of my family. Um, and, and so the piece was about how do we change, how do we change this and we angle these messages so that um, people can relate to it and people can, can um, see themselves in the messages and know I'm just as vulnerable too. Um, and that's a, that's a big, that's a big part of it. It really needs to be angled differently. It, it's so much less about um, English and Spanish. And what you find, I mean, is, uh, is there a successful effort to do that? Is there underway or? Oh yeah. There's, something yeah, there, there's plenty. Um, totally. So, um, I mean, we can start up as, as North County, as North County gets, um, where we have um, mixed That's echoes. where most of the cases are. I mean, right. even excluding the prison. Yeah, exactly. Um, Santa, if you, if you take uh, the prison numbers out, the, the area with the single most amount of cases is, is Santa Maria. Um, and that's also where there's a high Latino population. Um, and, and there's also um, a lot of mixed techo speaking people up there. Um, and, and, and they're often forgotten about too, and many of them, um, they can't even read or write their language. They, um, a good portion of them anyway, um, can only speak it. So um, there's um, an organization that's just dedicated to, and a mixed techo radio station that's just dedicated to um, transmitting this in indigenous languages so that these people can, can get the message and hear it. Um, another example, um, you know, at cause, um, we have, you know, we have, uh, we have people, um, creating videos and interviewing other people, um, who also speak Spanish, who also look like them, who talk like them, um, who live like them. And, and so they can feel like, oh, I can call the food bank too, because this person at the food bank, um, here I can visually see them and they're speaking to me, they're speaking my language and they have the same, um, they know what I'm talking about. They know how I live at home, you know? Um, whereas if they just get a brochure that says, call the, call the food bank if you're in yeah. need of food, they might be afraid to call the food bank, you know? Um, it's really about connecting um, with people. Well, especially um, with the immigration situation from the feds being what it is. It's, I mean, yeah, it's there's a lot of fear. Yeah, they, they need to see that it's okay um, and, and that they're, they're, they're represented in this too. Um, and that it's it's safe for them to ask for help. So how about uh, how about the school uh, district, specifically uh, the Santa Barbara school district? How are they, how have they done? And and I, I know they were trying to uh, kind of address the issues of uh, spotty Wi-Fi of you know particularly I think Latino kids and ha not having access to yeah. uh, uh, computers or um, wireless and, and being able to Zoom classes, where does that stand? And so it's gotten better. Um, it, it's certainly not completely solved and, and unfortunately um, it can't be completely solved. Um, Todd Rickman, who's the, the, his title is Chief Technology Officer or something for the district. Um, you know, he said that there are kids that kind of just disappeared um, since this started and, and they've still disappeared. Um, and they're not turning up to class. And, um, and a lot of it falls on individual teachers in classes to call parents and say, I haven't seen your child in Zoom for X amount of days. Um, where are they? You know, um, it, it's, it's really extremely difficult to track that though. But the district has made progress in, in, in the way that um, it's not the best, but we do have a partnership, um, Cox Communications, where you do get two months free of Wi-Fi and then you have to pay after that um, I think that's irritating considering up north, um, 
Comcast is giving free hotspots, but um, you know, it's something. Um, and, and what's even better is the district is offering to do that work for the parents. Um, yeah. So if the parents can't figure out how to connect with Cox, um, the school district will make sure the router gets to them. Cox is so, Cox is so customer friendly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I had, uh, I chatted with uh, Kate Ford uh, of the school board a couple weeks ago about this issue of learning loss and, and how, you know, what's going to be the impact on kids, assuming they do go back in the fall, which would probably be, you know, in some staggered way or something. I mean, if they, they basically lost this entire semester. Yeah. Um, which for kids in the primary grades, particularly, I mean, there's a lot of foundational stuff that you do. So is it, is it a board of the district talking about that much? Well, okay. So last school board meeting, they had just Matsuoka, um, superintendent Carrie Matsuoka. Outgoing, um, outgoing superintendent Carrie right. Matsuoka. Outgoing um, superintendent oh, Carrie Matsuoka. Yeah. It was supposed to be going out this month. Um, I, I believe that Tuesday night we're going to really figure out um, where our superintendent searches. Um, but I just lost my train of thought. Sorry, Jerry. We were talking <laughs> about learning loss and you lost. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm I'm losing some learning apparently. Um, no, the superintendent Matsuoka addressed it finally for the first time um, last school board meeting a couple weeks ago, and and he said that um, he just started trying to imagine um, what what schools are going to look like um, starting in the fall, and he he said that for sure it's either going to be a continuing online education or like you just said, and and like Kate Ford said, um, if they go back, it's going to be some type of staggered model. Um, and he um, said that he would be thinking and talking about this more on Tuesday and it is on the agenda. So we'll, we'll see what he comes up with. Um, I've heard a lot of kind of rumors about it. What sounds the most promising that I've heard is, um, is making a half and half kind of every other day. Maybe you learn at home on Mondays and then you're in school on Tuesdays, back and forth and you, and you um, stagger that with other kids. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We, we hopefully are gonna get more answers or at least ideas to go off of on Tuesday. Yeah, and the other thing is that, I mean, the big, huge wave looming out there that's going to come crashing down soon is the budget. I mean, the, the state is, what, $57 billion, and, you know, that's where the money comes from, um, $57 billion short on revenue. So it looks like you had this story um, a week or so ago that they decided, with it, well, what we need to do is lay off the hourly food service workers while nobody's looking before we do yeah. anything else. But uh, that kind of blew up in Carrie's face, did it not? Yeah, yes, it did. <laughs> um, but it's it's coming back. Um, it's coming back on Tuesday night as well. And I'm expecting there to be a, a much larger public comment turnout. It was pretty clear that this um, was I, I don't want to say secretive. Um, I, I'll get blowback for that because, um, you know, Meg Jate and, and Carrie Matsuoka have been banging the drum since December that the food service budget is over budget. I mean, like, I'm not going to say that that's not true. They totally have been, and it's, and we've been looking for a way to balance that out. Um, but but Laura, uh, Laura Cap seemed like she had been blindsided by this based on her commentary at the meeting. Right. Well, she, what she was blindsided by, which is what everyone was blindsided by, is is the, the layoff part. Um, we knew we were going to have to do something, um, but we thought it was going to be, you know, cutting more of our partnerships with nonprofits and, um, you know, not feeding schools that um, don't meet the um, minimum requirement for students to get free lunches. Um, you know what I mean? Um, but there was never, hey, let's lay off 40 people. Um, and especially not in the middle of, you know, one of the most challenging economic times, like in recent history. So, uh, you know, it, that is what, what really threw everyone off. And that's kind of where all of the, um, you know, humanitarian comments kind of started coming in from most of the board members. Um, but it's back on the agenda for this Tuesday. And I think is now there that- anything else that's gonna have the James Fankners of the world uh, up in arms on Tuesday that we should be looking forward to? <laughs> um, that's a good question, Gary. Um, but it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean I was just looking at the um, I was just looking at the agenda right before we talked, and I I don't think so. 
Um, I think what most people are concerned with is that they just want everything open back up and they want their kids to go back to school, um, whether that's the James Fankner group or not. There's well, no there. well, for education, yeah. I mean, they were, they were not happy with the expansion of the um, bilingual, dual language uh, immersion uh, program. That's true. Um, it hasn't come up since though. I don't, I don't know if it's just because of the times that we're in that people don't have the energy or the wherewithal to, um, you know, band together because I could have easily seen this being, you know, hundreds of people flooding a room meeting after meeting if this was a non- The um, meetings are still, time. <laughs> the meetings still on what? Zoom. The meetings are still on Zoom, the school board? Yeah, they've been all on Zoom. Um, interestingly enough, the upcoming one this week says it will actually be held at the um, district office, but it said it's not open to the public. So I don't know what that means exactly. At the beginning of the pandemic, I went to one and it was me and one other reporter in the room with like plastic separation between us and then, you know, the dais. So <laughs> I don't know if that's what it's supposed to look like, but um, I'm hoping that there's going to be meaningful opportunity tonight for public comment. Yeah, uh, I mean, it really changes the whole nature of it as things. Yeah. When people are not in yeah. the same room, it, it just changes the vibe. And I think, you know, it changes the seriousness with which the officials listen to people. Um, it's, it's not a good thing for the future. All right, so real quick, what are you working on for next week? Oh my gosh. Well, um, two big school stories. Um, one, it's, um, it's, a, it's a little um, sad, but I'm trying to turn it into a positive thing. Um, since, since COVID has began and since the, the shelter in place orders has been put in place, um, suicide attempts have, have gone up with teenagers in Santa Barbara County, um, especially in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Um, so I'm, I'm looking into why that is and what, what solutions we can do to, to stop that uh, and how teachers can so you're gonna You're going to turn the suicide story into an upbeat story? Is that what I heard you say? <laughs> yes, Jerry. It's called solutions journalism. We oh. find the problem and then we write about the solutions. Um, <laughs> We used to just call it journalism, but what do I know? Um, so is that true? Suicide attempts are up or? or yeah, yeah. Um, education is up? Both, yeah. um, just all around. But students have, have been hospitalized um, more frequently um, for, for suicide attempts. And um, as a result, um, even um, Cottage Hospital um, is, is working with the district right now to kind of talk about that. How, and you, how were you able to get access to that data? Um, the, the district and, and the hospital. Um, and it's not, I don't have hard numbers. What I have is, um, I have the hospital saying there's been a significant increase in people ages like 12 to 18 um, trying to commit suicide. Obviously, the hospital doesn't have the data of which high schools they attend, so that's yeah. more, more difficult to filter out. But talking also to the district, um, they've, they've given me plenty of anecdotal evidence that it is, in, in fact, um, going up and it's scary. Um, and and um, the isolation for a lot of students um, is, is really getting to them. So trying to tackle that and, and focus on um, how do we turn that around? Um, how do teachers, especially if we're going to continue this into the fall, um, how do teachers um, better look for and for these signs in students when they're not actually being able to be with them in person? Um, and that's another oh. one of those big waves that's just sitting out there, which is, you know, mental health impacts of this. I mean, this is, everybody keeps telling me kids are resilient and, uh, you know, I only raised three and have nine grandchildren, so what do I know? I, I, yeah, sure, they're resilient, but gosh, this has got to be so hard, you know? And I look at, like, seniors who you had a piece about the DP graduation. I mean, that's just terrible. Yeah. But, Deprived of this really important thing in your life, you know, all the kids going back or want to, you know, planning on playing football or even basketball. We may not have basketball. I mean, there's just so many things, and it's just, yeah. it's just, it's just not right. Yeah. All right. So, what's been the weirdest thing? I ask everybody this. What's been the weirdest or or strangest thing about the the whole experience for you? Ooh, that's a really tough question. Um, I think probably the strangest experience for me throughout this whole thing, um, I've, 
Wow, Jerry, that's such a hard question to answer. This whole thing has been weird, man. Are you reading? Are you reading all right? Are you keeping yourself? I'm, oh, I'm, I don't want to get. I mean, I um, what do you I've get? had my right? share, my fair share of um, alcoholic bouts during this thing, but like, um, <laughs> but I'm 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 pulling it together. I think you know what this has all taught me is um, that um. This community, I mean, I, fall, I fell in love with Santa Barbara. I'm not from here. I'm from San Diego. I've, I've been here for going on six years. And, um, and I know we're a resilient community, right? Like, I've been here through the mudslides and, and through the Thomas Fire and through Conception. Like, like I, I know how resilient we are. But um, this experience um, has really shown me how resilient a community we are and, and just how much people really do love each other and care about each other and um, have come together. I, I just witnessed so many acts of just selflessness. Um, and I'm not trying to be all schmoozy. I really truly mean it. it it's yeah. really made me want to stay here longer. I, I really, um, I love these people, especially, you know, reading about, um, reading stories um, from other communities. People aren't like us. People don't band together and sew hundreds of masks and then go feed the homeless just because they want to, you know? <laughs> You know, I, that's what this has really shown me. I know that's not great. Communitarian sensibility to, to say. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Delaney, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, we will talk to you soon.